All right, well, I'll just get started. I know people are continuing to come in. Um, my name is Jane O'Neill, and I'm very lucky to be able to be on the steering committee of the CASE OU, which is the Campus Alliance for Sustainability and the Environment. Sometimes these things just happen, and when they happen to you, you hang on tight as long as you can and, and enjoy it while it lasts. So um, I've, every day, every meeting I come to, I'm really grateful to be there. Uh, because people on this steering committee are just fantastic and they care so much about the planet. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who are joining us at a CASE event for the first time, I just want to share a little bit about CASE. It is, as I said, the Campus Alliance for Sustainability and the Environment. We're committed to working with the university to create a campus-wide culture of sustainability. We aim to minimize waste on campus, protect and nurture our green spaces, reduce the university's carbon footprint, and raise awareness about climate change and environmental justice. So in order to achieve these goals, it has to be more than just recycling and reducing energy consumption. We also must encourage new ways of thinking and living that will allow us to develop more sustainable relationships, to cultivate renewable habits, and most importantly, to generate new values that reflect our desire for a more just and habitable world. So one of the things we do to help do that is to present speakers every month, as we are today on the spiritual side of renewable energy work. Um, if you'd like to be on our mailing list or find out more about us, I've dropped a link in the chat. I'll drop it again in a few minutes after more people have joined. You can click the link and get added to our mailing list or, or just learn more about us. And I think there's a list of all of us on the steering committee. You can absolutely reach out to any of us at any time with anything environmental or anything that you wanna talk about. Um, so I'm really very excited to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Ben Luce is a physicist and a longtime renewable energy advocate. He is a member and past president of the New Mexico Solar Energy Association and was a co-founder and director of the New Mexico Coalition for Clean Affordable Energy. This was during his 14 year tenure at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, working in the area of nonlinear dynamics, also known as chaos theory. And I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since 2008, he's chaired the sustainability studies program at Northern Vermont University. And he recently founded Renewable Energy Now as a new means to provide education and advocacy services for the clean energy transition to a much wider audience. He's also a great banjo player, a sometime juggler, and he's my cousin. So I'm very proud and happy to introduce Ben Luce. Ben will talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it up for discussion. Go ahead, Ben. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's so nice to be able to speak to you today. Um, so, so this talk, it grew out of an interesting sort of history. Uh, I was in New Mexico this summer and uh, I happened to be a Unitarian church member and ran into a, another UU out there in uh, New Mexico. And uh, she, she invited me, I used to work with her on these issues out there and she invited me to give her talk at her local church. So I put something together while I was there. Uh, and then by word of mouth, I've given a second one uh, in my area here in Vermont. I live, I live just across from the Canadian border, way up north at northeastern Vermont, the northeast of the northeast, so to speak. And, uh, and then I've uh, connected with Jane recently, and uh, she invited me to give this talk. So, uh, and for me, this is kind of a, 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 a bit of a re-entry into this, this kind of public speaking and from kind of a new angle for me. Um, so let me dive in. I'm going to um, present some slides. And um, this, uh, this has a little bit of the feel of the church talks I've given, but um, is a little bit different in some ways. In those, I actually do things like play piano and uh, uh, do, you know, do other things that are part of those services. So, um, so I've, I've, uh, I'm not going to be doing that kind of thing today. I hope you're not too disappointed. And uh, so let me dive in here. And um, Let's see, I'm going to uh, probably, yeah, this will be the way I'll, I'll present it. Um, so as Jane mentioned, I have this new uh, organization, renewableenergynow.org. This is uh, an effort that is really just beginning. I was actually going to hope, I was hoping to offer some online courses this fall. Uh, and then my teaching load kind of uh, grew, basically doubled due to some un unexpected circumstances. So I'm putting that off to the spring. 
Um, but I'm still working on developing the organization. And I am networking with a variety of different people in different places on various projects. So we are doing our some of our advocacy work already. Um, this is a, from the sort of church side of it. Uh, this is a nice quote about, um, uh, about the sun as sort of being a generous energy source. And a very pretty picture of a sunset. Okay. Um, so yeah, my background. So I, uh, as Jane said, I'm a physicist. I was at Los Alamos for a long time. Um, and then, uh, well, I gradually got involved in renewables there, especially with uh, starting with the renewable energy, uh, well, with the New Mexico Solar Energy Association. Um, what really got me going was presentations I saw about climate change at Los Alamos, where they have a big climate uh, program. They use their giant supercomputers to simulate uh, the, the, the um, uh, uh, ocean current system on the planet and the weather systems and, and, and make these uh, 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 global climate model predictions. And that, that really got me concerned. And this is in, in the mid nineties. So I started diving in and, and volunteering with the New Mexico Solar Energy Association to kind of learn the technologies. Um, and then after a couple of years, I became convinced that uh, we weren't gonna make much progress unless we also worked on policy. So I started getting involved in policy. I got really heavily involved in policy. And for a decade, uh, I just, was working all out on policy and we were very successful actually in the long run um, against very steep odds. Uh, New Mexico is dominated by the fossil fuel industry and uh, um, we eventually got through a renewable energy standard and solar tax credits and uh, some strong incentives for uh, photovoltaics uh, and a bunch of other things. Um, it was a wild adventure, um, taught me a great deal about the realities of the world and, and also how to do policy. Uh, and I also did a great deal of public education out there with the NMSEA, uh, organizing fairs and developing curriculum and things like that, making public presentations. Um, since then, I've been in Vermont. Um, it's a state that I spent a lot of time growing up in when I was young, some place I really like. Uh, I've been teaching physics here, but I also teach courses in renewable energy and electricity and electronics, things like that. Um, and I've been involved in a, a variety of, of renewable energy work here, um, kind of mostly on the local level, but some on the state level as well. Um, the main points I really wanted to get across today, I've put right up, uh, right up here in the front slide here. Uh, the main point really is that uh, I encourage people to really get directly involved in the transition to renewable energy. Um, Americans uh, often feel very disempowered. And uh, because of that, we often have, a, have trouble kind of making that last step to really get involved. Um, and so the kinds of things I, I'm encouraging are uh, educating oneself really deeply about the technologies and policy mechanisms, you know, really getting into those details and, and learning, kind of learning your stuff. Um, on the policy side as well, uh, policies often ignored um, if you start to talk about policy to people, their eyes will often glaze over. It's hard for them to kind of get involved. Uh, promoting and facilitating projects in the local community. There's a lot that people can do that way, even if they can't do a lot with their own home. Um, getting involved in policy advocacy, whether that means actually showing up at the state legislature or really working on public support for policies. Uh, writing letters to the editor, those kind of things, whatever it might be. Um, transforming one's own footprint where possible. Um, one point I make, I, so I have a, 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 I have a paper that summarizes a lot of this on the website. It's right now it's kind of buried under my bio on the website at the end of the bio, there's a link to it. Um, but one of the things I emphasize in there is that uh, there are corporations out there that would really like to see us just focus on our own carbon footprints and not really look at what they're doing and not really look at what's happening in policy. Um, but it's really, uh, I think I say this in another slide here too, but I really want to make this point. It's not really our fault as citizens that clean energy is not very accessible in many, in many cases. Um, it's and that and that as individuals we can't do all that much in our own homes. We may not be able to afford an electric car, even though that's that's changing a lot. We may not in the past we weren't able to afford PV systems and things like that. 
um, but just doing what you can. Um, but then again, not losing sight of the really big things, the really big changes that can be made through things like policy changes and getting and working with organizations in the community and things like that. Uh, and then another major theme, and I've, I put this in italics because I think it's one that people don't think about too much. Um, if we just leave the transition up, even if it happens, if we just leave the transition up to corporations, uh, it won't necessarily get done very well. Uh, we may have development of inappropriate sources. Um, we may have just badly done project development. Um, people may not be able to benefit personally from the financial gains that clean energy can potentially bring if it's done right. So not just uh, cheerleading for clean energy, but really trying to guide it in the right directions. Um, and that's something that really takes attention to detail and getting really directly involved. Uh, now, um, the real involvement with this stuff can um, have some downsides. It can take a lot of time and effort uh, and as, it could be very stressful in many ways. There's a lot of, of negative things that can happen within it. But the positives of it too is that um, from a climate anxiety standpoint, um, I find at least, and I, I think many people do, that really being involved is a really good antidote to, the, to climate anxiety. Um, if you're really deeply worried about this, I think there's nothing like actually getting involved in, in making the change happen. Um, and when you do get involved, you learn a lot more about the potential for making change, which itself can, can really address that. Um, also camaraderie. There are a lot of people involved in this now. And for me, I've had wonderful experiences being involved with groups of people, really some of the best, uh, the best camaraderie I've ever experienced in my life has been with the groups of people that are trying to make this transition happen. Um, that can be a wonderful thing and can really help address um, the negative aspects of the emotional aspects of what we're facing. Um, and of course, being really involved actually just helps accelerate the transition and it helps optimize it. And if you're a, a young person, if you're a student, um, being really involved can be a great way to network and maybe find a, a career within this area. The career opportunities in this area are blossoming. Um, now, um, the next couple slides are slides that I normally put in. I probably don't need to put these in for most of the folks on this presentation, but when I present to um, church groups, they often um, are coming from a, a much less involved standpoint on this issue. Um, so I, one of the things I do is try to really make the point that we are really in the final stages now of a, of a desperate battle to save really missed the boat about 40 years ago uh, about getting serious about this problem. You know, we, we knew about this and by the mid 1980s even, we, we had a good idea that we needed to do this. Um, we had some good momentum then for renewables, but it was, uh, it was largely lost except for some technological gains. So, um, so the hour is very late. Uh, we, need to get, we need to get rid of fossil fuels and we need to transition. Um, we also can't conserve our way out of this. There's uh, uh, people that are well-meaning people often um, look at, at prudent use of energy first. Uh, and I, it, that, that's an instinct I, I well understand, but um, I really try to be very firm with people that we, we, we just cannot conserve our way out of this. We're, we're not going to be able to talk uh, the, most of our citizens in worldwide into using almost no energy compared to what we use today. Um, if anything, it's the opposite is happening. A lot of countries are using more and more and more. Uh, and our technology is actually quite efficient. The, the efficiency gains we've seen um, in terms of higher efficiency refrigeration and cooling and heating systems um, and lighting, other things like that, we've gotten much more efficient. Uh, but that's only gained us a certain amount. So we really have to go after the sources. We've, we've got to switch to zero carbon or carbon neutral sources. Um, I I've, I've personally strongly prefer renewable sources for a, a, lar a, lar a, a large variety of reasons, which we can get into if you want when we discuss more later on. Um, that said though, efficiency improvements can really help facilitate renewables. Uh, heat pumps are a good example. 
Um, making a full transition to heat pumps in a building often, especially in a cold climate, often is just not possible unless the building is well insulated. So efficiency and renewables actually can go very well together. Um, we, we, what I'm really saying then is we just have to be careful about um, not putting renewables off in the idea that we, we can just do efficiency now. Um, and then also more generally, uh, I'm focusing very strongly on transitioning to renewables here, but uh, there are of course many, many other things we have to do. We have to preserve habitat. We've got plastic pollution. We've got all kinds of other environmental issues that are, are the crucially need to be addressed, but we just can't put off the transition to clean energy anymore. Uh, we, we, that just has to be a major upfront now kind of priority. Um, on the good side of things, on the positive side, uh, renewables are actually doing remarkably well. We are truly on our way now to being able to replace fossil fuels relatively soon. Uh, when I first got into this business, uh, the number of, of new solar, solar power systems going in in the state I was working in, in New Mexico, was a handful, four or five a year. It was just basically off-grid people um, it, pathetically small. And yet, if you looked at it, even in the mid nineties, uh, renewables were growing exponentially. And one could predict that if we could keep that exponential growth going, we could really transition things uh, fairly quickly. Um, now uh, we are seeing uh, many, many, many tens of gigawatts of, of renewables being installed worldwide. Uh, a gigawatt is, an, is equivalent of a large power plant uh, it means a, bi a, a billion watts. Um, this was pretty inconceivable just, just 10 years ago. And, and here, here we are, it's happening. Um, so the, the goal that we really need to focus on is um, keeping this on track. Uh, it, there's very strong opposition now that really would like to bend the curve back down. Um, so that's really something we need to focus on. Um, we also need to focus on making this equitable and optimizing it from an environmental perspective and from a socioeconomic perspective. Um, all of these things are where ordinary citizens can actually have a great deal of effect at helping influence exactly how this is actually implemented. Um, I have a quote here from my grandfather that was very impactful to me. Um, he once said, the secret to life is being involved with something greater than yourself. Uh, and I, I thought at the time when I first heard that, it didn't make that much sense to me. I understood it, but it wasn't until later I, I, I really came to believe in that. And, um, and in the current climate, uh, we are seeing a lot of people finally really coming out of the woodwork, really pushing and demonstrating for change. Um, but we really also need to be really directly involved in that in the transition, and that's really what I'm what I'm aiming at, and that really requires a constant level of involvement. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here a bit now, a couple over a couple of slides, um, and get right to to the point here. Um, so, uh, one of the things that one can do is get really involved in in educating the community. Um, and really fielding, uh, fielding real equipment and knowledge where people can access it. Um, right now, so much is done online, but, uh, but in some ways being really out in front of people physically can in some ways have more impact these days because I think a lot of stuff kind of gets buried and lost online. Um, that said, you know, good, good social media work too, which I'm sure a lot of younger people can do a lot better than, than I can, uh, can also be very effective. Um, but this shows the kind of things we used to do in New Mexico, and that group still does out there when it can. Um, this is a typical sort of uh, group of, of volunteers that uh, with, I'm standing in the middle there with my little solar bolo tie. Um, uh, this is at, a, uh, at an Earth Day fair uh, where we we put equipment out. You can see part of a little PV system there. There's the charge controller there. Uh, you can see there, there's a tray there where we were baking solar cookies. And there's a literature rack over there to the right of literature that we would pass out. Um, 
this is at a this is at an energy fair in Taos. Uh, I'm I'm demonstrating a, a solar hydrogen fuel cell system there. Um, interesting, the hydrogen has really come back onto the to the screen again as an energy storage mechanism. Um, this is a, actually a very good example of a technology that needs to be guided in the right direction here. Um, there's a lot of corporations that would like to be producing hydrogen mainly out of natural gas. Uh, I think it's uh, it, there's a much greener route uh, producing so-called green hydrogen by electrolyzing water with renewable electricity. Um, that idea has been around for a long time, uh, but is now finally coming back to the fore. This is, uh, I'm sort of demonstrating a little efficiency demo here with a young visitor. In, uh, on the table there, you can see there's a passive solar house model. Um, there's a PV system to the right. Uh, we would really try to field real PV systems, not just toy systems, but systems that could actually do something, really, really show appliances being powered, uh, let people actually touch the technology. You can see here in this uh, this setup. This was my um, home setup. I would take this. I would partially power my house with this, and then I would take it to events like this and power uh, appliances and show people how this stuff really works. This is an Earth Day event down in Alamogordo. Um, that's our big Sun Chaser van in the background. This was a a vehicle we built in the late 90s that had a full a full functional solar hot water system on it, um, a small PV system on it. This is one of our uh, volunteers baking cookies for people. Um, we would train, we developed school curricula and uh, developed portable systems that could be put in the back of cars and uh, uh, trained uh, people to go to schools and make presentations. Um, the community fabric to this organization, the New Mexico Solar Energy Association was really quite remarkable. Uh, and um, I have to say the backbone of the organization really were, were the women that helped uh, organize the uh, uh, organization at a fundamental level and really keep it together. And this is um, our president of the time, Rose Kern, uh, celebrating her graduation. More solar cookies. There's some parabolic cookers there in the background. Um, we would do uh, events. This is a, we would help put on a, a large solar music festival that was powered by solar energy each year. And then we would get to go up on stage and promote what we were doing. Um, this is a fellow who uh, was quite uh, quite skilled at making uh, radio controlled solar cars, which is was a really fantastic way to turn young people onto on, onto uh, solar solar energy. Uh, he would make larger cars and then these little tiny guys. I, I, I like to joke to him that I, I would call these uh, solar cockroaches. Uh, he didn't like that term very much, so I didn't use that publicly. Um, but they were a big hit. This is at, uh, at an Indian school in uh, Santa Fe. This is the, the Santa Fe Indian School. Um, I speak some Chinese and, and have interest in that. And one of the things I've gotten to do is work with visiting groups of Chinese students to talk with them. And that's always fun. They, they have a good laugh listening to my bad Chinese. Um, but, uh, facilitating projects uh, can be very effective. Uh, this is a group of my students installing a PV system on campus. And um, I had a, a little hard time getting them to keep their hard hats on, but uh, uh, it was still very effective. Um, the guy that's on the top there facing away is actually now working in the industry full time and is is very effective player now in Vermont. Um, and that's Bernie Sanders there. We had Bernie helped us get some funding for our project at the time. It was pretty interesting. Um, here we are with some instrumentation. We did a lot of studying of the solar resource. So there's a little 
uh, meteorology setup that we stuck in with our solar system. And one of the things we did with the data from all the, of that is really study the uh, uh, means by which we could reduce um, the impact of snow on the systems. In Vermont, um, snow on solar systems is a bit of a problem and uh, has not been really adequately addressed by the industry. Um, here's a, this is an interesting uh, example of, guide, of how to guide development. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a sort of Vermont style timber frame system that we put in at a, at a local environmental stewardship uh, center. Um, this system allows the panels to face vertical during the winter, which is great for snow shedding and actually gets a pretty good level of production. And it's made with more sustainable local materials and it draws on local uh, construction expertise and really fits the style of the area. And here's the system with its, uh, its uh, summer orientation just after we completed it. Uh, churches actually are a good, a really good uh, target for project development. Um, we managed to get a, we managed to uh, pioneer the first community solar project in Vermont uh, on top of our Unitarian church. And this is our, our church with a system. Um, various uh, congregation members own panels on the right hand side of the, the, the array and the left hand side of the array is counted towards the church's electric bill. And uh, there's Bernie in the middle. <laughs> uh, he helped us get that that through um, a little bit with certain political things that we needed to make the community uh, aspect of it work with the utility. Um, conferences, renewable energy conferences are a good place. Uh, I take my students to these on occasion and uh, sometimes have them give talks if they've done research projects. And um, Electricity, uh, the, uh, renewables really to understand them deeply, uh, it's good to have some real technical education in this area. And um, renewables provide a really interesting motivator for people, for young people to get into areas of technology and learn about them um, where they might otherwise not have a lot of interest. Here we are studying a uh, solar hot water system sufficiency. Okay, um, this is a, a, a passive solar house in New Mexico. I just wanted to throw this in uh, and just make a plug for the, the really deep level of development that you can find in that state regarding um, passive design and, and earth friendly design. Um, this is a house that was hand built by its owner. Uh, it has a large trom wall, which you can see on the right hand side there. Uh, it's powered with PV. Uh, he has battery storage now. He has an electric tractor. <laughs> um, there's a lot one can really do, and there's a, a really deeper level of involvement that can be done with this kind of kind of thing, where we can really push the envelope and really make buildings that are more deeply attractive to people. And that that's a the deeper aspect of it, which often gets lost in the mix when we're just trying to field a lot of PV systems, but it's worth considering. Um, now the difficulties, um, uh, there are a lot of challenges in this area. Um, renewable energy is a, an area where, you know, everyone has an opinion and it's a very, it's a hot topic. Um, being a, a, a member of the male gender, uh, you know, uh, I will speak for men saying that we can be a little overbearing and uh, uh, controlling sometimes. I think a lot of the world's problems emanate from that and that, that you find that in the energy world as, as elsewhere. Um, so there are a lot of issues there. Uh, energy is tied to all different sorts of different aspects of the economy. People often have conflicts of interest of various types. There's a lot of technical complexity. There's a lot of political complexity. There are very powerful special interests which are opposed to moving ahead with clean energy and very powerful special interests that are moving forward with it, um, but sometimes not in the right way. And there's a lot of psychological things that one has to deal with. Uh, disappointment being one of them. It's a very difficult area to make progress in and sometimes takes many years. Um, I was very much in this fray very centrally for a long time um, doing this kind of thing. This is a blurry press photo uh, at a press conference we, were, we gave when we were fighting for our renewable energy standard. 
Um, putting on a suit and tie was something I was never all that comfortable with, <laughs> but had to do a lot. Uh, this is one of our advocacy teams uh, during one of our semesters uh, or uh, legislative sessions, I should say, at the New Mexico Roundhouse, um, really developing a network of people and uh, that play different roles and are tightly integrated and have different skills is really essential to this kind of work. Um, this is uh, me uh, at, at the podium. Um, uh, with Governor Richardson signing our renewable energy standard after we fought for it for about eight years. Um, that was a good moment. Uh, the, uh, the negative side of this is that uh, Bill Richardson is, was not the most ethical politician out there. And uh, it was actually extremely difficult work, uh, working uh, to try to get his administration to do the right thing. Um, uh, I could talk for hours about the complexities and the challenges of that are, that happen when you're really deeply involved in the political side of things. The most important thing is to really try to keep your integrity um, and uh, not let the system compromise you. Uh, this is uh, at the signing of our solar tax credit. Um, that's uh, 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 Senator Feldman uh, give, at the podium, who was our champion for that. Bill, we finally got through. Um, the one of the biggest challenges in getting our solar tax credit through was actually the solar energy industry. There were parts of that industry that were really threatened by having a new solar tax credit because they were afraid it would engender competition that they hadn't had to face in some years. So you can find uh, the the complexities you can run into are myriad and can come from unexpected places. We were uh, promoting both solar and wind. Uh, we managed to get through, one, once we managed to get through the, the standard uh, project started to go in. This is at the, uh, on the opening ribbon cutting day of the 202 megawatt project that uh, resulted from our efforts in, uh, Eastern, on the Eastern Plains of New Mexico. So I'm gonna summarize, I'll, I'll finish here. Uh, this is a quick summary of the, the items I have at the, um, at the end of the talk, or sorry, at the end of the paper I mentioned. Um, and uh, I will just go over these briefly. So the first one is really just bringing attention to clean energy possibilities in your community. Um, sometimes there's a lot that could happen that people just aren't uh, pursuing because no one is talking about it. Um, really learning about renewable energy technologies, really understanding the technologies themselves um, and being directly involved, maybe e even playing around with toy systems, that kind of thing. Um, educating yourself deeply about clean energy policies. How do they really work? Uh, there's a wonderful website called uh, the Database of State Incentives for Renewable Energy, dsireusa.org, that's um, funded by the Department of Energy. Uh, fantastic site for finding out what your state has, what's going on. Um, being really educated about that is, is key. And then also being aware of what are the energy politics in your area? Uh, what is your local utility really doing uh, behind the scenes? What, is your, what are your local towns and counties and, and state reps really promoting uh, and really speaking up about what they're doing? Um, lowering your own carbon footprint uh, is, I think, that doing what you can to do that, um, but keeping in mind that some of the other actions, such as working on policy, might actually have a lot more impact. Um, keeping in mind that it's not your fault, that clean energy can be difficult to access, and knowing that <laughs> there are powers out there that really don't want you to be looking at what they're doing and at what's going on with policy. Um, promoting clean energy transition at, at institutions, so colleges, uh, universities, churches, um, state government, county government, town, town offices, schools, um, those are, are places where a lot can happen if, if things are done right. Uh, getting involved with local clean energy groups. Um, uh, you may not have a, a, a nonprofit in your area that's really uh, promoting this effectively, or 
you may have an industry group instead of a, a true group of enthusiasts and advocates. Um, so providing that um, that nonprofit structure or that community structure, you might consider uh, starting a group like that. You guys have a group like that. That's what you're doing right here, meeting. So that's that's exactly the right idea. Um, thinking about how uh, other pressing issues act, we are facing a, we are we are facing a lot of uh, challenges to renewable energy now, potentially coming from uh, changes in corporate law. Um, we also have, of course, we're threatened by problems with loss of democracy, uh, voting rights. Those things are probably become, becoming more pressing issues to work on as well. And considering um, how those actually act on, on energy development as well. Um, then there are finally, there uh, last two, there are the deeper aspects about what, uh, what one might be able to do. Um, really designing sustainable homes from the ground up or sustainable developments, championing those larger sort of projects, those deeper sort of projects, um, more interesting things, um, connecting, uh, connecting renewables with agriculture, um, so-called agrivoltaics, uh, where uh, agriculture can work in harmony with photovoltaics. Um, those on sort of second level types of things. And then finally, uh, maybe perhaps shifting your career into this area. Uh, I find a lot of young people, even today, with all the talk about climate change, many of them haven't even really considered working in this area because um, the career tracks, the traditional career tracks are still pretty prominent and emphasized. Um, and we don't have a lot of infrastructure for explicitly uh, getting young people to conceive of a career in this area. All right, well, that's about it for the moment. And um, I'd like to open it up to general conversation and questions. So you can uh, just jump in, unmute yourself, or um, raise your hand and I'll call on you. But I'd like to hear more about um, your comment about women organizing and keeping things together. Um, I'm no scientist. I'm not a pub public speaker. I don't have that sort of stuff to offer. But the things I am good at, that's what I bring to the table when I, I can organize an event, I can bring a speaker and I can promote it. And so that's how I try to get involved because I'm good at that. So talk about people who don't have those, you know, they're not going to be able to uh, do what you do, but how can they still help? Yeah, I think that's crucial. Um, I emphasize that people should educate themselves about the technologies, but not everyone's going to become an expert on the, on on you know the um, the the electronic transitions in photovoltaic junctions and PN junctions and photovoltaic cells, right? I mean, that's just not going to happen, um, and it, sh it doesn't need to. Um, there are so many different skills that are needed in, in an organization. Um, what really kept the NMSCA afloat, for example, was careful attention to the bylaws, careful attention to the budget, careful attention to identifying, applying for, and administ administering grants, um, running meetings. Um, meetings can get very contentious, and maybe more so today than even then. Um, so skillful 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 governance, um, uh, knowledgeable governance about, about how to govern a nonprofit. Um, there's a, a great deal to know about how to really run a nonprofit effectively. Um, also project development. Uh, there's a lot that one can do now on helping people uh, do projects. So um, just even just directing people towards the towards good resources can often be very effective. Oh, and, and the personality side of it. Um, when I first got involved with this, what I saw was, and I'll just be frank about this, a lot of older white males who really liked to dominate the conversation, kind of dominating the organization on a verbal level, and a lot of the women in the organization doing a lot of the real work. Uh, and I've I've consistently seen a lot of that that and um, and I, I so I really encourage women to get very involved with this and push back against that kind of thing and really work for a, 
a more equitable um, and uh, less ego-driven kind of movement. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you so much for presenting. I've really enjoyed your presentation. I'm also from El Paso, so I'm pretty familiar with Alamogordo and such beautiful places. Um, so when I when I saw the title of your your talk, the spiritual side of renewable energy work, managing climate grief and anxiety, I was really excited because as a professor of political science and international relations with a focus on Middle East politics and human rights, I, I realized, and, and also reading my student evaluations, I realized that my teaching can be very depressing and stressful. And also in spite of all my best efforts, I'm also sometimes finding myself awake at night, still worrying about things. And I guess what I do personally is I just, I just repeat to myself that, you know, we can't know what's actually going to happen. So the thing to do is try to make the process work as well as it possibly could, as you mentioned. But I'd, I'd like to ask you something really personal, not to put you on the spot in front of uh, 24 or 23 people, but could you speak to your personal process in this as somebody who is trying to encourage students and your own personal process and keeping going, how do you encourage students to surmount their fears or not surmount them, but at least work through them rather than simply turn off, which I know is, is very tempting to a lot of them. So when, when I first saw what was going on with climate change, it scared the wits out of me. And I had, I had literal nightmares about it for a couple of weeks. It really, really bothered me. And I, sometimes I still, you know, when I see a footage of the Amazon on fire or the, the West, the Southwest on fire or similar things going on, um, I can get very depressed about it. That, that can still happen if I dwell on those things. But I'll tell you, there is nothing like going out and spending an afternoon in public with some very interesting and, and effective renewable energy equipment, having a great time turning people onto it and sharing and being involved in that positive side of it. Um, I would come home at night from doing that with a trim, I would come back with much more energy from that than I, that I put into it. And that was consistent. And I experienced that consistently year after year after year. Um, and uh, I've gotten back into it more heavily now um, because, for the same reason. I just feel drawn to it and I feel empowered by it. Um, like giving a talk today, uh, I will feel very good about that. Uh, it relieves that sense of in, that pressure and frustration inside that's just like, ah, oh, I haven't been able to do anything. I can't do anything about this. It's very, that's a very uh, destructive feeling to feel like you can't do anything. So actually getting out and doing something. And I've been able to see the impact of what I've done and what others have done. And I see it all the time. And I think people can, like students can get, they have a lot more freedom than I do right now in their lives, potentially. They can, they can do a fantastic amount and have a fantastic impact. And I think that's a really good balance to, to those feelings. Great question, Laura. Thank you. Uh, Lily. Lily, you have your hand up. I think uh, Ruth can go first. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm from uh, UUAA, which is uh, the congregation in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we are connected into um, our National Green Sanctuary 2030 project, which gives us a lot of really good guidance in terms of particularly initial steps, which are the ones that we're kind of trying to finish up right now, which include assessment of the situation and what's feasible and you know what are people going to get excited about. Um, and now trying to work on the um, really getting down to the what is feasible, what are people going to get excited about and finding that as with, a, I guess, a lot of other places around, I'm not necessarily just in churches, but volunteerism is like 
really struggling. And um, it's a real challenge to try and get uh, people literally into an action. Um, COVID didn't help, of course, because things are still kind of zooming in much of the cases. Uh, and people are still, in some cases, very realistically um, hesitant to, uh, to get together and um, actually work on projects. Um, a lot of what you were saying made me think like, well, we, we really kind of need to literally take people to the action. <laughs> and um, I, I don't think we've done that yet, but it's partly our struggling to get out of the, um, the assessment and now planning mode, um, because we're also kind of pulled into some internal planning stuff in terms of priority areas for the congregation. So um, we feel often like we're trying to uh, coordinate a, a reasonable approach uh, that will fit everybody's expectations of um, what we need to do. Um, and I'm also getting somewhat of a sense of in the Midwest, climate change hasn't been quite as in our faces um, as strongly as it's been in the South and the Southwest and even the West Coast. Um, I would guess that where you are in Vermont is a little bit of the same. Um, and wondering if you have any particular thoughts about that. I mean, it's happening here in the Midwest, but it's, it's slower. The plants are moving north. The, um, the various flora and fauna are being affected. Um, we're going to probably see an influx of people who can are coming from other areas because Michigan for one is being touted as a place where uh, climate change is been, be going to be more positive um, than in other places. Uh, we're also seeing pressure on, um, I think initially now on real estate, meaning that people are buying it, not necessarily living where they are all the time, but or they are transitioning from places very unlike, um, particularly upper Michigan. And so we're going to be some, seeing some stresses, I think, on local cultures and local ways of doing things. Um, I guess it's all to say, how do you get your people you have now engaged and how do you plan ahead for, these are not exactly in your face emergencies, but it's gonna be part, I think, of long-term resilience planning. Um, you described Vermont very well there too. That's very much what we're facing. We're facing a, a sort of an influx of people escaping from other places. Uh, real estate prices have been through the roof as they have been most places, but very particularly here too, because of that. Um, and there is, this, we haven't been hit as hard. The Vermont public is very concerned though. Uh, and we have had a lot of positive action. We've also had some major misfires on the policy side, some of which I had to really go out and counter. Um, so uh, the fundamentals are really those, I, I would say, if you want to build an infrastructure, it's really the organizational infrastructure. I don't know what you have in Ann Arbor and, and, and your environs there regarding nonprofit advocacy groups and networks, um, but building those up and actually having, um, I think now, I know there's still a question about COVID safety and whatnot, but trying to get people together either online or in person and really doing something, really working on projects and working on education. Um, things like, you know, I think some of the things we did out West uh, with demonstration vehicles, um, trailers, things like that can actually be very effective still. Getting out on the side, getting out on the sidewalk, um, that kind of thing can be cool. I, the, the, these technologies mm -hmm. are really fun to work with and they're really, when you really see them right in front of you and you know, like one of the most fun things we did was we'd have a little panel kind of a little, well, actually like that little one back there, but sometimes a little bit larger, even as large as that, powering a water pump and you can stand in front of it, it shuts it off, and you jump away from it, and it turns back on. That's actually pretty impressive even today. 
uh, to actually see it. It, it. Solar solar power is kind of miraculous. You know, the sun shines on something and it produces this big effect without any moving parts. And really trying to convey that sense of of excitement about the technology and and the and the interesting the the intrinsically interesting aspects of it to people. Um, I, I, I think you've got a good handle on it, though. It sounds like, you know, you're, you're out there doing doing this stuff. Well, we we, in fact, are incredibly lucky in the, I guess, the southeast part of the state or and particularly in Ann Arbor. Um, there are congregations who are interested and there's sort of sort of organizations of congregations um, and not not just Unitarian. Um, we have a city that is very focused well, it has their own action plan that this election we're hoping will get some funding to go with it. Um, the, the county we're in is working on pushing through right now a, an initial draft for public um, feedback and hopes by the end of the year to actually have an action plan. Uh, we're in a state that has acknowledged the, you know, the importance of climate activities maybe not always exactly as we would like them to, but they are. Um, so in some ways, we've got an inc incredible richness of an environment to be working in. And it's really the initial um, boots on the ground uh, stuff that is like our concern right now, is you know actually getting more than the usual suspects. Um, involved in in this so i don't know jane maybe we can write a paper or do a slideshow or something later on yeah. to figure out um how you really energize it particularly in a time of pandemic and coming out of pandemic i think that's that's the big question i do know that when when you say to someone can you come here on tuesday and hand out literature or do this specific thing, it's a lot easier to get people to do that than it is to get them to sit on a committee. Nobody wants to be on a committee, right? That's um, for sure. So when we find specific things to do, it's easier. Um, but yeah, it, getting people to, to step up and get involved is, it seems like it's getting more difficult, not, not less. Lily, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, uh, I probably will be taking us on to a, a different direction here. Last night, I, in my cultural theory class, we were covering the material basis of our modern culture. And I had three assigned readings, uh, two of them by Katie Singer. I don't know if you've heard of her. She uh, had a book, uh, The Electronic Silent Spring. And the readings were on the cost of the internet and the cost of wind farm. And, and the other yeah, reading, yeah. yeah, the other reading is on uh, um, the energy of slaves, uh, oil and the new servitude. And what was interesting for me in that, in that book by Andrew Nikiforo is his talking about the way in which uh, once we got going with civilization building, you know, the, the rise of city-states, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, the, the labor of slaves became essential. And, and the past 200 years after fossil fuel, after oil was discovered, that uh, we came into a new era of servitude, which is no longer about just the enslavement of other humans and other uh, animal beings, but uh, the enslavement of the natural world in terms of extracting um, materials. And even if you're talking about renewable, so-called renewable energy, uh, one should begin tracking everything that needs to go into, for example, the building of uh, uh, solar, solar system or wind farm, uh, you begin to realize that you are still mining and you are still having to deal with, with uh, 
pretty much the enslavement of, of the natural world, seeing it as a, as a resource. So one of the activities that the students had to do is to select just one, one uh, raw material, rare earth mineral, uh, that is one of a thousand uh, that, that, ha that have to be used in the production of a cell phone. And, and in doing so, they were faced with the horror and, and the grief of what it takes to have this convenience. Um, the author of The Energy of Slaves says that any relationship <laughs> any relationship of master slave degrades both the master and the slave. The master, because he becomes uh, uh, dependent, it makes him lazy, it makes him unhealthy, it makes him dumb uh, and unskilled in, in the basics of survival. And I'm wondering in terms of, uh, you know, we're talking about spirituality here. Uh, and I will be probably asking a question of ultimacy. Is, is the goal simply to keep powering the way of life that we, we have always known in terms of our, you know, in terms of the goal of convenience, making life easier, and therefore seeing other people, other societies that still live on the land and still know how to grow their own food, how to hunt, how to fish, as being less privileged than we are? Or is it, is it about really asking hard questions about the goal of human life? And what, what, the, where, where uh, the author of uh, Energy of Slaves come out? is that there has to be a discussion of uh, devolution to a low energy society uh, as the only path of beginning to unravel that system of master slave. It doesn't matter if, it's, if we're not enslaving humans, but we are enslaving humans as we speak uh, when we do mining and, and uh, uh, but all the more so enslaving the natural world. Um, so I, I wanted to throw it out there. Okay, so uh, this is a deep topic. Um, so you, this is my own view on this. First of all, you know, there's definitely imperfect aspects to the renewable side too. And there are serious potential impacts from mining and things like that, especially if it's done badly. Uh, there is a lot of range for how it's done um, in terms of disposal of waste, location of mining, things like that. Um, mo most of the materials we are talking about here for renewable side are recyclable and reusable. And so um, those can be in play a lot more permanently with less long-term impact than we're doing with renew with fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are just a complete disaster and we're talking about complete destruction. Um, so what we're talking about is moving from something that's absolutely completely destructive to something that is more manageable that can actually be fairly decent if it's done right. Um, your, the total amount of energy usage I would love it if we could transition society to a much lower level of energy usage overall. And we actually have made steps in that direction, even just with the efficiency gains we've made. You know, an LED light bulb uses a pretty small fraction of what an incandescent did. Similar things are happening in transportation and, and, and other sectors. Um, I don't necessarily equate the amount of energy with the equity. Um, the, the size of the renewable energy resource, the amount of solar energy that's coming in and into the planet is truly phenomenal. It's not necessarily the case that we, we have to live in a very low energy society to have it be clean and have it be equitable. Those, those don't necessarily equate. Um, 
the less energy we use and demand ultimately, that would mean proportionally less impact from mining and things like that. Um, so I, so the, this gets back to my fundamental idea that people have to really think about how to guide the transition. We must make this transition in order just to survive. Um, and we must try to optimize it. Um, so I view it from a very much a kind of an emergency standpoint. Um, we can't really we can't put off this transition. It just it absolutely has to be done. But at the same time, we can try to we can try to optimize the way it's done. Um, when I look at rare earth elements, for example, um, there's actually quite a few places around the planet if you look carefully where that potentially can be extracted, and there can be quite a bit of difference in how the impacts actually play out, both environmentally and socioeconomically. Um, the other thing is, uh, too, there's a lot of potential uh, innovations in the technology. We don't necessarily, we may not need to have as high a reliance on rare earth as we think we do right now. Um, there are a lot of promising things such as uh, uh, flow batteries and other things like that that could provide a lot of alternatives to rare earth. So, um, so I, you know, uh, I totally with you on the idea that we need to try to we need to try to make this as equitable as we can. Um, it's a very we're, we're facing a very difficult challenge to do both. I'm trying to get my hand up here. I don't know if it has gotten registered. No, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Jim. Yeah, uh, just along the the same line. Um, I find I'm I'm Lily's partner, her husband. So uh, we've been married for a while. It uh, means we think alike in many ways. <laughs> I want to stay married, uh, <laughs> but no, I'm there anyway. We're both there. And, and for me, one of the ways I talk about it as I teach uh, is walking on two different legs. One that's involved in where we are now, the immediate struggle, pushing back on water shutoffs in inner city Detroit where I live, um, pushing for a water affordability plan at the policy level, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, pushing for uh, renewables um, over fossil fuels, but also listening to people like Katie Singer, who, who maps out that, yes, even though the wind uh, turbine materials are recyclable, we're already up against a problem of what to do, like with the blades uh, and what it takes to transport them. And what the dilemma for me is I'm any more convinced that when we ask the question of sustainability, we need to look two places. One, what's the history, evolutionary history of the planet? So Marsha Bjorn Narut, Reading the Rocks, a uh, geologist up in Wisconsin talks about in, one, in her book, uh, the Paleontology Database Project, looking at what has happened with ecosystems over the last half billion years and the trophic scaling laws that says the larger your body size, the fewer in number you are. And the smaller, the more of you there can be. And that those, the ratio of who eats whom and body size has remained roughly constant for the last half billion years. Um, Species come and go in the ecological niches, but something about the force field of the relations of eating and body size has remained balanced and stable. And as part of the, the beauty of the planet, the, the amazing um, hospitality to life in all of its constant creative adaptations and, and even competition. But she says, until human beings started to do agriculture, we seem to be bent on trying to make ourselves an exception to that rule. And now here we are, 7.8 billion of us on the planet, quickly headed to 8 billion. And now in a situation where George Mambiat will say, presently to feed everybody on the planet, 
the average distance a piece of food has to travel is 1,367 miles because so many people are now living in cities that are not surrounded by hinterlands that can grow food for that population. And that's a real seeming to, to me impossible dilemma. It would seem from the evolutionary point of view, we're due for downsizing, even voluntarily, or nature will accomplish it for us, which I think is part of what's happening now. Um, and of course, it takes out the poorest people, the most vulnerable people first. And that's a travesty to me. Uh, I'm willing to go to jail resisting that. Hey, I've done so. I also think the other place to look are indigenous folk who'd have known how to live in place from generation to generation to generation, who put in place, usually through ritual and spirituality, limits on their own population and the uptake of the surrounding ecosystem and more than human world, and inculcate this incredible respect where you, you don't just take stuff, you don't mine. Um, those are the two things that speak to the big picture leg uh, alongside the more immediate do what you got to do, we got to try to survive leg. And walking on those is what I tell people we got to try to do what I try to do. I don't think I do it very well. So but my fear but, 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 is, just one last comment here. My fear is when we do push the renewables, what we also subtly do is communicate to people we can just keep this thing going. You know, that as you come up with solutions technologically, what people do then is back off on their willingness to change to something that actually historically was more sustainable. That's the question for me. So th that's an interesting one. Um, it's generally the case, and it may not remain the case, but it's generally the case that people that get involved with renewables personally, like get a PV system on their house, they also tend to be the people that strive to be very efficient and really work on the efficiency side as well. And oftentimes, and this is potentially helpful or hurtful, but oftentimes they have a they have a philosophical outlook that is more aligned with where you're coming from. Um, one of the things I do emphasize, though, as I did earlier, is that it's a key thing to be able to not just go rah, rah, rah for the renewables, but to guide them, to try to guide them in the right direction. Um, wind power, for example, we had a big problem with that in Vermont. Uh, we had all these multinational corporations come in all of a sudden and try to blast and bulldoze the ridges at great ecological cost to put in wind projects that actually we knew would not would not produce all that much because the capacity factors weren't all that good, that the environmental impacts would be horrific, that they didn't really have the transmission to support, that really wouldn't fit the state's environmental or aesthetic values that wouldn't have be in our economic interest. So we had to push that back. And we did. We fought for five years and we we won that battle. We, we pushed it back. The emphasis is now on solar. Then with solar comes along and people are, some companies abuse that. They want to come in and, and cut down large swaths of forest and build that. So now we're really trying to emphasize how do you do solar in a ecologically and socioeconomically uh, more compatible way, uh, integrating it with agriculture carefully, being careful where, where you cite it, citing it close to load and incising that matches the load, things like that. Um, so those are the kinds of, of immediate things that we can work on on the guiding that speak to that much higher principle that you're talking about. Um, so, you know, I, I totally, uh, totally sympathize with everything you said. Uh, I, I think aspirationally, that's that's what we have to try to keep in mind. Um, but we are also, you know, what we're facing is a giant fossil fuel steamroller, and that's going to wipe everything out. Yeah, and that may, you know, we may get the downsizing you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, but if we do, even if that happens, and even if we suffer tremendous amount more damage from climate change, I think we're still in a better place if we wind up with a civilization that's based on distributed renewables instead of large centralized fossil fuels or possibly large centralized nuclear or fusion-based nuclear 
Um, and just throw in one thing on that. Uh, Fusion is getting close. And I think a lot of people are starting to think, oh, we can back off on the renewables now that we can go to Fusion. But Fusion may open up another can of worms that we have not even begun to think about much. Um, it's a kind of concerning to me uh, that we may have uh, people with potentially small portable fusion reactors that can power weapons or power devices that can have uh, deleterious impacts on the land. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, this is one of the reasons why I favor trying to scale our civilization to utilizing the immediate energy that we get locally. I, I think that that leads us in the right direction at least. Um, let me go to Colleen. I see that um, her hand just went up. Uh, did she disappear? Oh, there she is. No, I, for, I forgot to turn on my mic. Um, thanks, Ben. Uh, I, I, I want to just follow up on um, what uh, Jim and uh, Lily are saying about technology in our culture um, and um, I think I think it's a really important conversation that we're not really having um, on any kind of large scale. And I think it would be interesting to maybe get some of us together who are sort of in the mind space that we can have that kind of conversation, you know, um, in a really, in a profound way, like who are far enough along that realize like we, you know, we, we are, um, ready for like deep systemic change mm -hmm. in terms of of energy use and technology use and try to i mean i don't know you know i don't know how to do it i really thought for a minute that covid was going to mm -hmm. um change us as a society that we were going to slow down that there was this realization that oh you know our society is broken, we have to change things. And I think that there's some crumbs of that left um, for people that maybe if, um, uh, you know, activists can kind of pick up those crumbs and, you know, somehow help uh, some people remember, like, and, and, um, and really kind of drill the lessons of COVID um, somehow. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, work with technology a lot. I teach technology in my classrooms. And one of the things I talk about is cloud computing and how how that that just that name in general is is an obfuscation of the truth of what that means. And I think um, it would be interesting maybe to try and have our group talk to a group of technology technologists on campus um, to try and ev even just um, hone a messaging, some sort of messaging on that, or what would the the working group look like? You know, of like uh, I, I can't even get the language out. You know, of of um, what it would what what it would be like to um, to reduce energy use because in a way that's it's rejecting some part of participating in in a particular wedge of society right you have to say no to social to some 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 parts of using apps and phones and you know the five macintosh products that i have and you know but I think that um, your point is is really important. So, so that to that angle, so the kinds of things I would wonder, you know, what's going on in your state? What's going on with net metering? Um, what's going on with your photovoltaic incentives? Uh, what, how are your incentive structures and utility go governance structures? Uh, aimed at promoting different scales of renewables? Are they just promoting the large scale? Are they promoting the distributed? Um, how do, what are the economics of all that? Um, where's that? What are the siting rules? What are the project development rules? 
those are the things I think that really get at the traction. If you can get those things right, you can potentially get a great deal of local small scale sort of development going and people getting involved with this when they'll, they'll actually do what you're hoping. You know, they'll actually reduce their energy use. They'll actually come into that more environmental fold and they'll, real, they'll realize that for themselves. But it's difficult to do. You have to get, you know, to the state house or to the, uh, the public utility commission or. We have, now, I see Jin, Jing has a. We have to flip the, uh, the state legislature. That's what we have to do. Very and, difficult to do. Yeah. Or by the way, it, the politics are not necessarily fully against you. There's a lot of support on both sides of the aisle for renewables, which is, it's actually in some ways easier issue than some of the others. So then some of the social issues. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm actually walking on the Pollyann Trail right now. <laughs> One of the benefits of COVID uh, remote working. Um, I grew up in Shanghai and later on a city called Hangzhou. Um, it's uh, known for its scenic beauty. And that was when um, I got in touch uh, or got amazed by nature and seemed well, to have uh, lasted for now. Um, Ni hao. Uh, Ni hao. Hangzhou. Well, Hangzhou, you uh, know Alibaba, ma? Uh, hmm. Alibaba is where Alibaba is headquartered. Ah, uh, Hangzhou. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah. What, what, who you know? Zhang Hou, you, uh, you, Shi Hou, in, in Shi Hou's place, ma? Shi Hou, yeah. Shi Hou, Shi Hou, yeah. Shi Hou, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I just um, I asked you a question over the chat, but I'm just going to verbalize it uh, now that I got my uh, ba battery back for my for my phone. Um, do you see this field of renewable energy as uh, much of an internationally collaborative field, or do you think it's um, especially with the Chinese colleagues of yours, or is that being impacted with the um, current political outlook? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I'm very worried about that. Um, one thing I noticed in China, China was way ahead of us in terms of solar hot water systems, electric vehicles, electric bikes. You know, they're all through Chinese cities. Um, there's a lot of uh, some of the some of the Chinese government policies are very strong. There's actually been a really good trend there towards moving towards renewables. Uh, I think 90 gigawatts were installed of PV last year in China. So I've been very hopeful about that. And 10 years ago, I was really hoping for a very strong collaborative relationship on that between uh, the US and China. Um, under Donald Trump, of course, that really fractured and frayed and things are really bad right now. And, and it, I, I really grieve that because that's a, that's a huge opportunity lost. Um, that said, there's still a lot of solar production in China. Um, I don't have any qualms with that. I think it's good. Um, there has been some examples of uh, environmental issues with Chinese PV manufacturing. Uh, I'm not completely sure of the current status of that. Some of that did get corrected. And there are some very good companies there, which do, I think, a very good job from what I've been able to tell. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, so increasingly though, uh, you can see even with all the negative politics that have happened, um, there is a really big international renewable energy industry and movement. Um, and, and I really, I'm personally counting on that because if the, if politics go completely South in the United States, get really bad and we can't make any progress here. I think much of the rest of the world is is still and will still be progressing and can pull things along. Economics may pull us along. I think to some extent the economics are. It's very interesting if you look at Texas. Um, that, that there's a great deal of renewable energy that's been de being developed and had and right now is filling up the development queues, transmission queues in Texas. So yeah, really good point and and um, and I think I'm with you on that. Thank you. You're welcome, Xie Xie. Uh, 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 u
Well, I don't get many opportunities to speak to <laughs> in Vermont here. So there's, there's like one person I know at a local cafe who I can speak with, and that's about it right now. Yeah, I would, would be happy to both practice uh, Chinese English dialogue and also uh, discussions on renewable energy. Oh, hun hao, hun hao. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, well, we have about eight more minutes if there's any other comments or questions. I probably should follow up and say that uh, even though I mentioned uh, that my students uh, expressed tremendous grief at the assignment, they, I also saw the beginning excitement. It's this wild-eyed uh, uh, interest and curiosity. And they said, so this is only about my cell phone. What about all the other gadgets, all the other machines that I have, I have in the house? Because, you know, the, the culture of consumption uh, really pushes you to, to accumulate because that's, that, that's part of what it means to be a full human being as far as this culture is concerned. And you pity people who, who are living otherwise, right? They, you think of them as impoverished, you think of them as backward. But, but the thing uh, that I saw uh, with this excitement is that they would like, they, they said, this is the first class where we ever talked about anything like this and uh, everybody should know, right? And so I like the idea of, of the word transition because I understand that there's no way you can go back to, for example, hunting and gathering. Uh, there's just too many of us and the planet is too, is, is too wrecked, right? To, to, to allow for 7.8 billion of us to survive uh, with hunting and gathering. But, but uh, at the same time, uh, thinking about what should we be transitioning to? Because I understand that there hasn't been anything discovered that can approximate the, the power and efficiency of fossil fuel oil. Not, not any of these uh, alternatives. Oh, well, I, I have to disagree with you on that, Lily. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the fossil fuels are tiny compared the fossil fuel resources minuscule compared to the renewable energy resource. This is something that I think people don't appreciate too well. Um, it's hard for us because if you stand in the sunlight, it's hard to appreciate that there's a bright sunlight, that there's a thousand watts of energy continuously streaming in each square meter. Um, th these statements that proponents of renewables make, such as that just a small a solar collection area just a small fraction of the Sahara Desert could power the whole world. That's accurate. But what I'm then that terrifies me because it means that we can keep going with with our consumption level and with the kind of culture that we have. We can maintain it ra rather than. I, I, underst I understand your feeling about that, and and I would hope that we could become a little bit more like you're saying to be more in harmony with things. But that thousand watts per square meter is the energy scale of the environment. That's what powers the natural environment. And, and it's actually not unreasonable that we could use an amount of energy that we currently use if we capture it renewably. That is, that is not a terrible thing. I think where, where the difficulty becomes is if we continuously keep mining in a disposable way and we keep like with fossil fuels, if we just keep doing that, where we're, we're just pulling the stuff out of the ground, putting it into the atmosphere continually and continually making more and more plastic and dumping it in the ocean. Those are the things that really terrify me. Um, I also go back to this basic notion, and I just have to be firm with people about this, is the reality of this is we've got to, we've got to fix this. We've got to shut fossil fuels down soon. No matter what happens with the total energy use, 
what you know it's just a priority so for me that's i'm i'm laser like focused on that and at the same time trying to figure out where we can guide that in directions that make it better there's a lot of people that just naively promote renewables and you know for them it's oh any kind of renewable is okay without really thinking about the details and they don't even have they haven't even learned the details they don't even really realize some some of the stuff that the criticisms of wind for example that have been brought up that, that have been raised today those are real um with wind power you have a system that requires a lot of steel a lot of carbon fiber um a lot of rare earths and it's moving parts there's a lot of energy in terms of maintenance and disposal with a photovoltaic panel you have a a, a microns thick layer of something the the bulk amount of material is tiny it sits there in an inert form um for generations potentially uh and and can produce electrical power uh it's it's there's almost no comparison between the two and and for that reason i i suspected that solar power is going to dominate renewables completely pretty soon it's already starting to happen and it's and it's relatively benign um, especially silicon based um on on the back side of that there's the recycling issue right now we don't have the systems in place that can recycle pv panels for example but there's furious development going on and developing those and the stuff that's come out in the last the research projects that have taken place over the last couple of years demonstrate that it should be re relatively straightforward to implement pretty clean and effective recycling of, of PV modules, basically developing these baths, which can dissolve the whole thing and separate out the stuff and, and potentially reuse it completely 100%. Um, that's, that's, that's where it really can head. Um, whether we put those systems in place though, whether the regulations are in place to make that happen, um, whether there are, uh, you know, whether we do the mining in a completely horrible way or a better way, I don't know that 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 comes th those are the open questions that in my mind are unresolved yeah and we really appreciate your work in this regard i think it's very important work you're doing that is one that is one Oops, sorry 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 that's okay it happens to me too thank you thank you thank you ben for coming and uh sharing uh, your knowledge with us and if there's nothing else, we can close. Any other comments before we close? It's one o'clock. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful to meet you. Take care. Thanks. And I'll look forward to corresponding with some of you perhaps in the future. Yeah. Jing and others who might want to do that, just let Jane know and we'll we'll follow up.